Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Tone Aries podcast. I'm your host, James. I'm joined by my good friend, Timmy Long. Hi, everyone. Roman is on the decks. Say hi, Ron. Hi, Ron. Mary Prendergast is in the audience. Say hi, Mary. Hi, everyone. Mary's a patron who's uh, invited down um, to see what she's after investing her few euros in, which is our lovely studio. Yeah. So I hope you like it, and we'll chat in a minute. Um, without further ado, we've got two educators in the building, uh, Terence McSweeney's staff, uh, which is Nakanahini Secondary School, Miss Phil O'Flynn is the principal, and Yvonne Callanan is t- a teacher. We'll go with Phil first. For the people that don't know you, do you want to tell us a little bit about where you grew up and where you're from? Well, I'm very proud to say I grew up on the north side. I grew up in Blackpool, the heart of Blackpool, yeah. and I went to school in Farnry. Um, played basketball on the North Sage and, you know, have a real strong attachment to it. I um, feel very lucky to be back, you know, uh, working on the North Sage in the last 11 years. Um, in fact, a lot of people say that you often end up living and working a half a mile from where you grew up. And that's true of me. Mm. I ended right back there. And uh, I came back there by accident, actually, uh, in 2007. I was offered 14 hours to work there. It wasn't even a full-time contract in the height of the kind of tiger boom. And I was a bit sick of the whole tiger boom at the time and mm. walked back into Nakahini and just found so much meaning there, working as a counsellor in particular, you know. Guidance counsellor. Yeah. Well, not guidance. It was pure. I, I trained in UCC as a counsellor. Oh, very good. And I was working with a lot of um, students who... I was just awed by their courage, really, and their bravery and their, uh, you know, ability to be so open. And I thought I never want to leave here mm. and uh, I haven't. And I suppose my role has changed over the years. Um, four years later, the deputy's job came up. And at that point, I had no permanent see in the school, no permanent role. And I went for the job. But um, I really went for it for a number of reasons. I felt I wanted to be part of a culture change that I think needed to happen mm. uh, for not just uh, me or this, the people who worked there, for the students, for the community. And I, I, might, I might say more about that later. Yeah, we'll come back to that stuff in a while. But Yvonne, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, yeah. so my name is Yvonne Callanan and I am living on the other side of the River Lee. But yeah. I have to say my heart is most certainly in the north side. Um, I first walked into Terence McSweeney Community College maybe seven years ago now. I, and it was actually as part of a workshop we were running up there um, with my college. Mm. And I, I just instantly fell in love with the kids and I knew it was exactly where I wanted to be. So um, the following year we had to uh, apply for a placement mm. and I applied for Terence McSweeney's and I was very lucky to get a place there. And uh, I've been there since. So, and I don't plan on leaving anytime soon. <laughs> Fair play. So, yeah. But if you're in a, if you're in a job you love and you enjoy, why would you leave? You know, some things yeah. are you know you can't um, you can't quantify or you can't uh, match mm-hmm. them with money. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's definitely ha- yeah, definitely having a teacher that wants to be up in Ochnini, which is an aim for being you know a tough place to, yeah. to, to um, teaching and whatever else. But for somebody to be want to be there is fantastic, you know. And, yeah, um, and we've spoke earlier, and we can see. How much you really enjoy your job up there and yourself as well? Mm. You know, it's 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 amazing to have yeah. teachers like that up there. When we had uh, Nick, we had Nick, Doctor Nick Flynn on the podcast mm-hmm. a few months ago, and he was saying um, when George, when none of them were expanding the surgery and they were recruiting for doctors, they couldn't get any doctors. Yeah. Nobody would apply for the job. Um, is does that translate into teachers as well? Do people are people afraid of the area That's, because of the name has? It's very interesting, you know, uh, because recruiting teachers at the moment is really difficult. No matter where you are. No matter where you are. But last summer, you know, I was looking for six new teachers and people were kind of, I knew when I was saying like, I need six new staff here because we're growing and expanding, which is really good. Mm. But, um, you know, I managed to get six teachers, no problem. And I think what's after happening now is people know if they want to work in this type of an environment is very rewarding. One of the teachers yeah. I recruited actually last summer, he used to work in what could be considered a tough part of Dublin. Mm-hmm. And he said to me uh, recently, and I really liked that he saw that, he said, do you know what? He said, what I really like about the kids here, he said, is 
you know, people might think they're tough, but they're actually quite soft. Mm. He said, there's no malice at all. Yeah. And, you know, I, I would have experienced that a hundred times, you know, that if you respond to the kids in a certain way, no, it's not all smiles and roses all day long either. Mm. You know, I mean, obviously there are functions of my job that I find very difficult and challenging mm. given the nature of my personality. Yeah. I wouldn't be a natural disciplinarian type, you know, mm. but like I liked that he said saw that in the kids and that he was able to respond to it. You know, he said they're actually quite soft. Mm. And I, I've seen that. I mean, you know, I, I remember one time it was on crutches. I was trying to think I was still 22 and I was playing a basketball game and I tore a muscle. And like there were kids in my school helped me out every single day. Yeah. I opened that door for you. Really kind. And I think we've been very united as a school community a lot of the time, mm. uh, sometimes for very positive reasons, sometimes for negative. Unfortunately, you know, we've had our share of troubles there, mm. but it's amazing how, you know, I remember after a particular, I suppose, upsetting event in the school community and in the community in general, you know, a number of the even starts uh, said to me, are you all right yourself? You know, you did a lot over the last few days. And I thought there's great empathy there. Yeah like uh, from the kids towards us mm. as well, you know, makes it really special. Yeah, but I think that comes from the parents as well. I think there's, there's um, in, in the area where we're from, there's a great, um, people look out for each other. I think we all, there yeah. can be a bit of a siege mentality. You know, it's like um, we're in it together, do you know what I mean? And uh, mm. I've always felt a great sense of community up in Northwest Cox City. I'm sure people feel it, talk or in the Mayfield in these areas too, but, but where from, I always felt like that, um, you know, if you're out walking the dogs, you could bump into an absolute stranger and get chatting to for 15 minutes yeah. and, and, and walk on and, yeah. and that be this. But you would you mean? agree as well, like James, that maybe uh, Nakahini is coming of age. Like we were meant to celebrate that the community was 50 years old last year. I know That's James right, Trumi yeah. was very yeah. involved in organising that. And in a sense, that pride that's there and that kind of community and that, you know, we've got each other's back. I think that's an emerging feeling about Nakahini. Mm. You know, that in a sense that people are starting to say, well, this is our place, we'll take ownership in it. And I see that as their reaction to the school as well. Mm. You know, suddenly I think local people are proud of the school, they're proud of the school's achievements. The school's had a lot of great profile in the last couple of years, all down to the students' achievement, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, I could rattle off a hundred amazing events. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm always name dropping them actually. And <laughs> I've been involved in them and lucky to involve it with being mm -hmm. with, you know. But I mean, you know, I go back to going to Sistine Chapel with two of the students with the edge, you know, that was come back mm -hmm. now a couple of years ago. And that was kind of the start really of a whole of oh, people start the narrative around the school start to change. Mm -hmm. But I think the narrative around the community is starting to change as well. Mm. So that like we're not the best of being the worst anymore. Mm. Or actually these are our achievements. They're real. People like yeah. yourselves, I think, really important. How how has the school changed since you've been there? Um, I'd say Yvonne would have a lot to say about that as well. But I feel like I'm obviously part of a culture change there. Uh, where I think it's more person-centred, culture, student-centred. culture change, is that amongst the teaching staff? I think, yeah, I think the staff that we have there are, are really amazing. I mean, we uh, we brought in the restorative practice there a number of years ago. Right, would you want to just elaborate on that? Yeah, I think that's that been really positive for the actual whole school. And instead of like taking a punitive approach to certain situations, we take how can we actually heal this and can we learn from it? Mm. And it's even, you know, we, we apply this every single day. Mm. And sometimes people, it really works and sometimes it doesn't. But mostly, uh, in fact, I think we talked about it a little bit earlier about having the emotional language to put on your experience. Mm. We now have charts up in the rooms which said, I felt anxious, angry, etc. you know, mm. when that happened. Because if you don't have the words to put on your experience, sometimes it's a vast sea of confusion that you're trying to navigate. Can you give me an example of the restorative practice in practice? Like a, a generic example mm. of what that actually looks like. What it actually looks like. Uh, I suppose one that comes to mind, which I think worked very well, and it's a number of years ago, so it's kind of a safe example. Um, to these two students, a boy and a girl, had a, you know, an exchange in the corridor that she was hurt by mm. and offended by. And basically, 
he questioned what, what he said to her was over the top. Now, in, in previous culture of a school, that's a suspension. You used faux language, you were abusive, you were yeah. this, you were that. So now you have to carry all that around as well. You're a 16-year-old boy, you might be feeling very good about mm. yourself in the first place. So we, we worked with them separately and he was very nervous about it. He'd have preferred the suspension nearly, actually. Yeah. He said at one stage, what am I going to have to do now? Talk to her, you know. Yeah. <laughs> this was nearly going to be the worst thing he's going to have to do. And it was very interesting. She was very angry. She was very emotional still. So she was going to hold this in for him unless there was some repair done. Mm. So they were brought together anyway. And he actually said to me, it was so funny, really. He said, I hope you're not going to do all your counselling thing on me now here. You know, I nearly prefer to take the punishment. And I said, you're afraid, aren't you? He said, yeah, I'm afraid. I, I, I'm afraid of what's going to happen here. So it's kind of there was a lot of risks for everybody involved in the story. So anyway, they eventually sat down together. And I thought it was such an amazing ending because she was bitter before she went in and cross and upset and angry. And she said to him at the end, you know, I have to say that I was probably more upset because I always see you as quite a nice boy around here mm -hmm. and suddenly you were acting the macho man and putting me down mm -hmm. and that felt doubly worse and he actually was like close to tearing up and he mm -hmm. went oh I never meant to make you feel that bad mm -hmm. and actually they became the best of friends isn't afterwards. that very powerful though uh, yeah. it's a simple example yeah. but like nobody's walking away then kind of with horrible guilty feelings negative feelings about themselves mm -hmm and negative feelings towards each other. So it's about as much about how the person feels about themselves. And we've done the same with teachers where a teacher and a student okay. has we, had a falling out. Do you think we could do that Mary Lou and uh, <laughs> Leon Matt? I know, I, I know. Yeah, yeah, well, I, I think you could try it, but I, I think it, it does need some skilled handling. I've seen it with teachers, you know, where a teacher's very offended and then we ask the teacher and they might say, look, I'm not ready today. And then the next day we try the piece of work and it's amazing um, how so much the relationships are repaired and restored rather than broken. Mm -hmm. And you know, the way we all had that experience in school, you'd run in with a teacher mm -hmm. and they kind of held it in for you for the next five years. Yeah, so it prevents that happening yeah, as well. And in, in, in criminal justice system, restorative justice would be, yeah. and I said it before, you know, yeah. when we were around Carrie Ann, when we were, yeah. you know, late teens, um, you're expecting to be arrested and to go to court, you know? But I often thought, like, if I ever sat across the table from somebody's car that we took or somebody's house mm -hmm. we burgled or something, and you could explain to me, like, that that was my van, you know what I mean? I, and all my tools were in the back of it, and I used that to work, and now I can't, I've no job, and the kids need to be fed, and I can't bring them to school, and, you know, um, I robbed my house, I know, um, you know, I had to get in cameras, and we can't sleep, and that would have had way more of an effect than going to court and get community service or getting a couple of months in prison. Because you expect that and you just factor that into this is a part of the lifestyle I live and every now and then I might have to go to prison. But I think that it's there's a mechanism there that's probably underutilized and not used enough. But it's great that you're using it. Yeah, we, we enjoy it, you know, and it's I think it's much more respectful of everybody in it. And there's learning in it. Have you ever um, been on the table, across the table from a student now? Uh, for restorative practice, yeah. I don't think I have, have I? <laughs> no, I suppose you, you like. I think you nearly do restorative practice conversations yeah. every day. Every yeah. day, yeah, it's just natural now at this stage. Like what I really love about it is that everybody gets a chance to be heard. You know, mm. it gives an opportunity, like as Phil said, for repair to happen. Um, but I think like what we're trying to achieve across the board within our school is to provide students with a platform to be heard. You know. Um, and the start of practice most certainly gives them an opportunity to, to do that. So, do you know when, um, Timmy, you, you often spoke about, um, do you know, not being able to put the names on your feelings, mm -hmm. like having having all these feelings, but didn't have not having the vocabulary or maybe the understanding as to uh, what's this, why am I feeling like this? But if you're doing something like that from an early age, then you start to think like that's anxiety, that's anger, that's fear, mm -hmm. that's frustration. Mm -hmm. The emotional development is unbelievable. And them yeah. kids will be very mature, you know, or at least more mature than if they hadn't done it. And a lot of them are probably not able to feel all those different things. And a lot of them are probably using alcohol or drugs as well because they cannot understand what's going on in their bodies with all these different emotions and stuff. And I'm in speaking like this now because that's how it was for me 
you know um and i suppose if if i was being taught that you know with your charts up on top of the wall and saying i feel like this now you know i would have been curious as well and i said well, you know what? i feel like that no but i never knew that that was the feeling because like i was 30 in my 30s and i didn't have a clue what feelings or emotions were didn't know what they were i knew what anger was and I knew it was sad, but, but other than that, it was everything was oblivious to me. But I think it's fantastic that even in a secondary school, mm. it's important to have those charts on the wall. You have a master's in student voice. Do. Will you tell us a little bit about that? I can. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I I just completed my master's. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Through COVID. Uh, yeah, through COVID. Not easy. Um, not easy, no. But I would feel that our students probably, you know, um, went through maybe possibly more than what I did you it's know it's a very noble statement isn't it? yeah well it's true I mean yeah. I was very lucky I had everything I could possibly have needed mm. at home at the ready for me you know whereas I know a lot of our students you know didn't and l- luckily we were able to to support on that one um, but I completed a master's in student voice around policy design um, and development um, and we specifically kind of looked at the code of behaviour in the school and as we all know like with code of behaviour who, who's it actually for it's, it's for students mm. so um, we got a group together uh, quite a diverse group so it was open to whoever wanted to to get involved and Phil uh, very I'm very grateful that she was also involved as a leader of the school um, but basically we looked at how we could improve as a school as a whole and the students led the way on that um, so I, I, I recently completed it and since then we're actually looking at another policy uh, around relationships, relationship management in school as opposed to maybe, you know, behavioural management. So uh, your code of behaviour in school was student led? Student led, yeah. That's unreal, isn't it? Yeah, Do you know what great. it sounds like? It sounds like a book in management called Maverick. I don't know if you ever <laughs> read it. It's yeah. like this guy, he owns a company in Brazil, a massive um company that developed pumps and stuff for ships and whatever else mm. and they were going to the floor the company was they were losing everything and he just one day he got sick because he ran himself into the ground and he went back to brazil after being in america sick in the hospital and he stopped everything and he went in and he asked the employees what did they want how would could they fix things and it went on to be one of the most successful businesses around he went on then and done talks for microsoft apple all the big car companies in america so he just gave the students or the students the employees a voice and what they wanted how much they thought they could get what their wage should be how much his wage should be he was demoted (laughs) you know they stopped all the office bureaucratic structure from the top down there was nothing like that anymore they dealt with everything there was no Massive offices, everything was open inside in the office. There was plants there. It was absolutely fantastic. And they went on to be very, very successful. I was thinking there, I wonder what the young people in Nakanahini were salary they'd give ye. (laughs) 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 But that's fascinating. What department, where did you do that from? What what was that master? UCC. Oh, brilliant. Yeah, an image. Yeah. Brilliant, brilliant. First, that sounds very interesting. I might chat with you about that uh, off camera. Absolutely. Um, do you know what annoys me? Do you know the Irish Times feeder table? Mm-hmm. Does that annoy you? So does, you know. I mean, uh, you know, I, I often think um, I was invited onto uh, the national radio station one day with, my, with one of my students post the leaving search, you know. And uh, they really wanted me on as a balance to certain other stories that there were and I, you know, was an honour, obviously, to be invited on, but we didn't go on because, you know, the boy that was going to go on with me, you know, didn't get to 625 points and mm-hmm. wasn't going to, you know, go and do medicine in UCC. But he had completed his leaving cert from a homeless shelter. Mm-hmm. Now, I actually did say to the researcher who spoke to me and never went on, they were dying for me to go on, but I would, I said, like, he's still in the sh- homeless shelter. But I said, I think, to be honest, there is something wrong with our system that that mm-hmm. boy doesn't get 625 points and that all doors aren't open to him mm-hmm. because the discipline, the motivation, the actual, what all the things that he had to have deep within himself to keep going 
were just beyond beyond measurement in some ways mm. and i think in a, i think it's a very limited way of viewing people mm. and having taught in four schools i've taught in four different schools of course i'm in the school i love the best and yeah. you know i think he has the the nicest students in the world but i would say that you know i've taught in schools where you know high percentage of the students got 625 points and they were the second and third schools on the league table and, you know, I got a lot of pleasure from my work there because, you know, you think you're a great teacher of 10 of your students are getting 625 <laughs> points. But the reality is that a lot of the, like, I know we talk about equality and equity in education, but the reality is even with the government debt system, which is aimed at levelling the pay, playing pitch for uh, students from disadvantaged uh, areas or in schools qualified under the debt system, the pitch isn't level. And, you know, I know that a definition of equality is giving everybody the same and equity is giving everybody what they need. Well, the government has a long, long way to go before they can give students in our system everything they need. Because, like, the reality is if you're in a homeless shelter with no support, like, there is absolutely, the odds are stacked against you. Mm. And... The reality is as well that the publishing the tables makes certain uh, schools feel good, mm. I'm sure, about themselves. And uh, I think, again, going back to changing a school culture and changing a school image, you know, uh, can we work without our confidence? Can we believe in ourselves if there's a table <laughs> published every year? which says, you know, this school is the best yeah. and this school is actually the worst. I think it's counter education. I feel very passionate about it. You've yeah. really got me going on a I nerve know, here. Because, <laughs> I'm passionate about because it, it really is so wrong. Yeah. And the other thing is, you know, when I taught in school where I, you know, basically <laughs> would have taught, I, I remember one particular even sort of class I had and, you know, I think every single one of them got over 500 points. You know, does that make me better in the education system? I think I'm more effective now. But the reality is as well, I have students in terms of Spain Community College who have the raw ability of every single one of those students. Mm. But they have to be provided with a different set of opportunities to fully achieve that if yeah. that's what they want. And the other yeah. thing I don't like about league tables, you really have got me going here yeah. now. Well, I'll shut up soon. Run with it, run <laughs> Rant with it. over. But I, I think the other thing I don't like about league tables is that it values some achievements more than others. And, you know, I think it also creates, it just feeds into that belief system that if you are X profession, you are somebody. And if you are Y profession, you're not. Mm. And the reality is, I don't view the world that way. And I don't want the students in our school to ever master their self-esteem by how many CAO points they got. Having said that, like we have College Awareness Week um, on Monday and, you know, um, going to have you speaking now to yeah. me which I'm really delighted about that. Didn't know about it. <laughs> <laughs> so you can't back out now but like the reality is we have a number of our students who will be coming in who have graduated from UCC yeah. and MTU and that's a wonderful achievement for them but I, I honestly feel that it would be wonderful as well and now that I'm talking I might even do it. There are other students in our school like who are self made business people, for instance. Mm. I mean, I'm thinking of one boy in our school and he must be laughing if he's ever going to listen to this because I would have had a lot of dealings with him when he was in school. He didn't like school. He didn't like uh, a lot of the things that didn't make him feel very good about himself. He's done brilliantly since. He's got a fantastic business. I'm so proud of him. I support his business. He probably knows who I'm talking about there. I think but I do. Yeah, is, he, I do. is he a supporter of us? He is. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I don't know, we can't name him. We can't, we can't name him because we probably have to ask his permission yeah, for yeah. him. But I mean, I'm very proud of his achievements. Yeah. So like, there's no league table for that. So mm. that's why I think these league tables are very... Like, I think, to be honest with you, things are led from the top in ways, aren't they? So in a sense, like when you have a, you know, political, uh, you know, endorsement of this, uh, certainly no political voice criticizing it that I've heard. And you have the media driving these league tables. I mean, there is surely a responsibility 
towards society of a different type. And for the people that don't know, yeah. the league table is basically a table of schools across Ireland, broken down by county of the, 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 the progression was on to the university. But um, not he doesn't yeah. score too well, but no, no. it doesn't take into account either. People can go on to further education and training. They can go on to apprenticeships. They can go on and do great things with their lives. They can go on to arts. They can go on to music. They can do what they want. But it's, it's just measure at u- university. A university is not the fucking be all and end all either. Do you know what I mean? No. If you want to go to university, fair play to you. But don't be putting me down at the end of the table because I want to earn 50, 60 grand to work for myself as a tradesman. 50, 60 grand old being, being conservative there. like, But yeah. tradesmen can be quite... Well off. Well, I tell you, at the moment, threads tell us all probably, about it, Tim. Yeah, <laughs> they're probably the best paid in society yeah. at the moment. Um, yeah. So if you have a thread, you're getting more money than most doctors, I'd say, at the moment on a weekly mm-hmm. basis. You and know. what about the student who has to support the family economy by having to work all through the leaving cert year? And basically, I know a number of students who are working 20, 30 hours a week mm-hmm. and, you know, they need to do that. And they're finding it really difficult balancing that with a school program. I think maybe there should be, you know, again, I go back to equality versus equity. It's up to the department to come up with some magical thinking here but and you know see what, a way of rewarding these you know students. what their, their thinking is around, it's a meritocracy. If you're smart enough and you work hard enough, you will succeed and the cream will rise to the top naturally. But it doesn't matter, like, if you have two two James Lennons, right? One, um, they're not, say, if you have two James Lennons, right, 16, 17, doing their leaving sort, the same person, the same ability, one is in a home where the mother and father is there, the, the mortgage is paid, bang on time every month, they're not looking for food every week, you know, everything is secure and they, they have the money for grinds or whatever. And then you have the other James that's in a and b with his mum and his three siblings. It doesn't matter how smart you are or how hard you work, one has a head start. So like you can have the same level of intelligence, the same work ethic, but if you're starting down here, you're never going to get up there. But People not, that aren't from these areas use that. They don't understand that. Like, they think, like, mm. if you're smart enough and you work hard enough, short sure, Susie Grants, and Susie Grants doesn't mean anything. It's not just about, you know, financial capital either. Like, it's, you know, if you've nobody in your family ever went down to university or nobody in your estate went to university, it's going to be totally deviant for you to do it. But they're all working in block layers and carpenters and plumbers. So, What's wrong with you wanting want to do that? You know, that and it's as good very as anything difficult else. as well, James, as you well know, to break out of the norms of any culture. Mm. You know, um, you go back to, we were doing a course recently, myself and Yvonne and four other teachers called Trauma Responsive Schools, you know. Mm. It's all about how we would respond to students who may have experienced trauma and, uh, you know, and one of, the, one of the comments that was made, you know, that when... People do, I suppose, like yourselves, like both of yourselves with degrees and qualifications, you know, and that, you know, it's and I got a little bit too, like, you know, uh, it's far from lattes, you were reared, you know, Mm. it's, um, you know, because you step outside of that. So sometimes actually you end up belonging nowhere, you know, depending on your ability to maybe cross both worlds as such, you know, but I I think uh, that people who are involved in leading education, there's people, I suppose, in this country paid a lot of money to come up with uh, ways of, I suppose, responding to the needs of the student body. And I think, uh, I don't know who this point system serves. Yeah. I really don't. In fact, it was very, I saw students from very supported homes suffer greatly because of it as well. Because yeah. your self-esteem is measured now by the, the amount of points. You know. I know. Yvonne, I bring you in. Absolutely. Do you want to tell us a little bit about what your day is like, any given day or any given week? Like, what kind of subjects are you teaching? How many people in your class? How big is the school? How many people in the school? For, just for people who can get an image of what's like up there. So we have a mixed school, uh, both male and female students. Um, we have Terence McSweeney and Greg Clash of Vic Hivna. And um, we've recently opened up the Shoma Balia for some ASD students. What's that ASD? Uh, Autistic Spectrum. Oh, brilliant. Yeah. So um, we've quite a mix. I don't think any one day is the same. Um, I genuinely hop out of bed every morning um, and I go out with the best intentions to be able to support every student that I meet um, because, you know what, I actually get it back from them as well. <laughs> um, I, I've often heard the saying about, you know, um, 
they may not remember what you you taught them, but they'll remember how you treat them. Yeah. Mm. You know, and even when I look back over the last few years, I'm only at the start of my career, really. Um, I can remember how I've been treated even by my students, you know, let alone how I may have been treated by uh, former teachers when I went to school myself. They always stand out, don't they? They do. Um, so my days are very mixed. Um, I teach English and P. Um, but I would find myself kind of in a very much so supportive role. Mm. Uh, I base myself in one classroom. I tend to base myself in one classroom, uh, room 44. I don't know why there's a door still on the wall because it's open more than it's closed mm. from people going in and out. I think that consistency uh, is good for the, the young people up there to know no matter what's going on, Miss Callan is in room 44. Absolutely, you know. Um, and I would say like one thing that I'm very proud of myself would be um, even students that have gone you know, through the school and they've since um, left, they can still come back in the door, whether it's to meet uh, Phil or, you know, any other teachers. And I think that's testament to kind of the work we're doing up there. Mm. Um, they, it comes back to the whole idea of being like one good adult yeah. and a good role model. Um, you know, we kind of, we set the tone in the yeah. school. Um, and, you know, I think we're very lucky and the students are quite lucky mm. because... There's more than just one good adult in terms of Cleanies, you know, uh, and I think children deserve more than just one good adult. Yeah. They deserve a number of good adults. Um, even in my own life and through my education, like I struggled through education. I never in a million years would have thought that I would have become a teacher or, you know, uh, gone on to university or Stefan mm. A for the likes. And I know that I I had more than one good adult, you know, in, in secondary school and then through through education and in my career as well, you know. So did you went through Stefan F. I did. I went Stefan F. For first. Yeah. Isn't uh, colleges for education? Aren't they a great buffer zone between Absolutely. young people and the rest of their lives? You know, just to have that year or two. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we've all done. Timmy's mm -hmm. done the same. Chance I done the college. You come without them. We wouldn't have been able to do nothing, do you know what I mean? It gives yeah. you time to grow, give you time to get into it, to figure out what you want to do. Yeah. Um, so it's, I'm delighted that you said that you went down as well. Yeah, yeah, I did. And you know what? I, I mightn't actually be, you know, in the position I'm in today if it wasn't for Stefan Efa. Mm -hmm. um, it gave me a great opportunity uh, to grow and to kind of, uh, I suppose, think about what I want to do myself. But if it wasn't for two lecturers down there, uh, John Cunningham, who has since passed away, uh, piece, and Derek Scanlon uh, pulling me aside. This was post the CEO applications. I hadn't applied. I, I I didn't really know what road I was going to take or mm. if there was going to be a road into education for me from there. Um, because I, I didn't have much confidence, you know. I, as I said, I really did struggle through secondary school. Um, but they pulled me aside and they 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 were in disbelief that I hadn't applied. And they, they told me about going on to UCC and, um, you know, the P teaching might be might be the way forward. And, yeah. the, you know, the following year I, I went and I played and I was I was very lucky I got in. Fair play. Congratulations. And so are not me any school very lucky. Yeah. You know, oh, absolutely. I mean, so are not me any school. every day in my office, you know, there's some, you know, child could be upset or a couple of people might be upset in the course of the day. And, you know, I think what Yvonne said there, like, it's really true. There's a number of fantastic mm. staff there. But I'll say to a student, you know, I'm going to have to move on now. So I'm going to have to leave you soon. And is there anyone who could take my spot here? Oh, is Miss Canlon free? And, you know, I think you have that gift with the students yeah. that they feel so comfortable with you. But we are lucky there is like such a strong staff there mm. that very empathetic yeah. towards the kids. And the kids will say, you know, could I go for a walk with such a person? And I think because we stuff we were talking about earlier as well, you know, the kind of psychoeducation we're doing with the children, that they actually sometimes know, I just need to time out there for 10 minutes and yeah. then I'll be fine and be back mm -hmm. on task. But I think, you know, I remember really the day when Yvonne came with her group from UCC and then she looked for her placement. And at the time, I had no hours to give her. Like, I mean, it was, it was like, oh my God, I don't want to lose her. But I've actually, you know, I've been over teaching. And I said, I have about four hours here and she said, I'll come for an hour. So I knew the attitude straight away. Yeah. And we've had a number of people like that since who, uh, you know, and I, I think Yvonne is, is a very specially gifted person with, with students and has really pushed me on the student voice, giving the students the platform. And, you know, I worked in schools like where 
only all the sort of elite kids were invited into consultations or mm. to do anything, you know, the, you know, yeah. and suddenly the code of behaviour was being written by the people who broke it every yeah. day of the week. <laughs> <And> <laughs> one boy actually was really funny, he went up to Dublin Caswellus and in a way, you know, the, there was a few other schools presenting as well, you know, and I'll never forget it because he actually brought the place to like, we're just in stitches because he said, but it's really funny that I'm writing the code of behaviour because I actually broke it so many times, but I knew it very well. <laughs> no, so, no, kills the writer. And actually yeah. then to be part of rewriting it. And then he said, and then I realised, you know, that some of the stuff I was doing did affect not only me. And so in actually writing the code, mm. he actually learned about himself as well. Yeah. You know? Isn't it great to have the kids involved as well because you're giving them an opportunity to take part in something and not only that, it, it gives them the responsibility as well as helping them to grow, you know, and you spoke about the healthy adult there as well. Well, ago. I think, right, we can all look back in our lives and, and find somebody that we didn't realise at the time. But when we grow and mature and, and grow spiritually, we look back and say, that person had an awful good influence in my life. Yeah. And it'd be great for all your students, you know, to look back. In years to come, you'll be destroyed from chocolates. Like you'll be probably <laughs> look back and just say, you know, thank you very much, like because every single one of you were there, and and I think other schools should yeah. really follow your example of the kind of the community that you built with the teachers and the students as well. And but even great. even in when I was in uh, Saint Mary's on the hill, which is across the road from me to, to primary school. Like, I had some lovely teachers up there, and I could tell you, after that, my head four or five of them straight away, you know, mm. because you remember them, mm. you know, 30 years ago, you know, yeah. 25 years ago, and so I still see some of them around the place today, and we still remember, mm. I still miss Mr. O'Donovan, Mr. Yeah, Sullivan. Mrs. Lovers. Mrs. Lovers, yeah. Sullivan. Miss Nolan. Yeah. Like, they were all great people, like, mm. but yeah. I didn't have that experience in the secondary school, not Terence McSweeney, yeah. another one I went to. But I don't really remember the teachers down there anyway, do you know what I mean? But I do remember the good teachers. Mm -hmm. But um, So Nakanahini is a desh school. Will you explain to the people that don't know what a desh school is in compared to a non-desh school? And maybe what it looks like for somebody, like like for the teachers or the, the extra resources you might get for the status of being desh? Yeah, well, desh actually stands for delivering equality of opportunities in schools. Okay. So I suppose the aspiration is correct, you know, in the sense from the department who I've been a bit hard on earlier. Um, so they then we get we get a homeschool a community liaison officer for the school, which means that person is a link between us and the parents, which I think is a vital role, actually, mm -hmm. because, you know, Parents as well, you know, if their child is in trouble, they start to feel a bit negative about the relationship with the school. Mm. So well, what I, what this person does is say, like, I can go out and explain to you what the school is trying to do. So that's really vital. I think that's a yeah. fantastic role. And we also have a library attached to the school, which is, you know, there's only a couple in the country that's only 30. Mm. And we get that for being a desh school. And the librarian... We were also blessed with her, like she's a fantastic uh, role model in the school and a lot of people go into the library, you know, I sometimes students queuing to get into the library mm. and we talked earlier about mm. mindfulness and they get it, that opportunity to go in and they're expected to be quiet so they can be quiet. So mm. it kind of gives them that permission, which is which is fantastic. I suppose the other resources, then we have a lot of SNAs, our SNA staff are the dream team. I call them the dream team. Special needs assistants. Yeah, yeah. And we have a lot, we've seven now at the moment and they help the students. They're there for the needs of the students and um, the students adore the SNAs. They absolutely love them. So we have a lot of other resources then that come in. You know, we have, you know, special education needs teachers. We have a lower pupil teacher ratio, which I think is really important mm -hmm. because if you talk to people who get lost in education, they generally got lost and it might have been part of your own story in the school mm -hmm. that didn't work out for you. Yeah. You're one of 30 yeah. and that doesn't work, especially when you've loads of other stuff going on, you know. So we have kind of a one to 19 and in fact, we even lower it more. Our average class size could be 15, 16. And what I think then is the child gets the chance to be seen, to be heard, to be identified, you know, and they're not just lost in the sea of mm. people. So mm. like if you have 30 people in front of you, the average teacher of old anyway, go back 30 years, there was an idea that you had to be in charge, mm. you know, that you were 
as that phrase goes, the sage on the stage. Yeah. And uh, now I think there's that attitude, especially in our school, a lot of uh, student led learning, the guide on the side. You know, we, we switched that so that the student is in, is in control of their own learning. In fact, we just introduced a new way of reflecting on your learning in school today. So positive. The place was buzzing. Mm. All the kids were inside in the library discussing like their where they wanted to be and how they might get there with their teachers on one to one conversations. Mm. So, you know, like DESH is it's good. And in fact, since they introduced DESH, um, basically the actual gap between DESH and non-DESH schools has narrowed. But like the difference would be still um, quite large, you know, I mean, this voluntary subscription issue that I also have a problem with. Is that an annual fee? Yeah. So if you're in a private school, you're not only paying private fee, you're paying the subscription. Um, you know, we ask our parents for it, but we know a lot of them wouldn't be able to afford it really realistically. Mm. And with that huge pot of money in some schools, they are able to purchase extra opportunities for their students. Of course, of course. They're able to pay teachers who aren't employed by the Department of Education and have specialist physics classes and specialists. Now, I don't have that facility. Mm. Like I am always working on a shoestring. In fact, like my reports to the Board of Management invariably say that I'm overdrawn on the account once oh. more. They just roll the rise at this stage. We never have any money. The ETB have been good to me. They just ignore a lot of my uh, financial management because, you know, when it, when it comes down to it, if there's something needed for the kids, I, I think we have to provide it, you know, yeah. if it's interfering with their learning. Yeah. Like we had a boy recently there now and we do use the iPad. And, uh, he, you know, he just, he lost his charger. He didn't have a charger. What are we going to do? Not buy the charger? I, know, I mean, I know. what are we trying to do? Tie up his hand behind his back and say, oh, if you go and flourish and thrive. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think there is like that whole issue of how schools are funded. I think DASH is good. I think it's a long way to go. Mm. I, think the, I think they should be consulting more with principals like myself on the ground and see what do we need? You have know, you got like... Um is there like a principal's society where you kind of come together? Well, you can imagine when I go to a principal's meeting, which I'll go now on Thursday, actually, like I'm one of X amount of Desh schools in the city. And then even in that grouping, so here you have like three quarters of the schools non-Desh, and then mm. we have the Desh grouping. Even in that grouping, I suppose I'm probably dealing with more challenging, you know, set of circumstances as well at times, you know, mm. especially... Uh, you know, we talked about COVID briefly earlier. I mean, COVID was very brutal on certain communities. Mm. The experience of certain people was much <sighs> tougher, you know, and I think it was well put when somebody said, you know, let's stop saying we were all in the same boat. We were all in the same storm with very different boats and some were on jet liners and some people were on a raft, you yeah. know, and so, it's as simple yeah. as that. I mean, but the experience it, of people was particularly hard. It was very hard. And I know like the ETB did provide laptops for a lot, oh, of, a lot of students, brilliant. but that brought with it a sore problem because you're expected to be computer literate then. And like parents are at home with laptops under so much pressure. They never had a laptop, a computer maybe in their lives, you know. And I know this because my wife was working in education as well. And, you know, she had this kind of dynamic, you know, so there's so much pressure on children and the parents, you know what I mean? So it's great that you highlighted that. What was it like for a teacher during COVID? Um, they got a lot of flack yeah, in the media. Yeah, I suppose they did. I, I think it was different for, for everybody. I mean, even when you were talking there about the, maybe the struggles of using the laptop, I can recall numerous phone calls I got from colleagues about, you know, how to access Seesaw, how to avail of the iPad. And mm. they were the Moodle adults. Like, and teams. And, yeah. yeah. But, you know, like imagine how, how the students were feeling on top of that. You know, it was very, very difficult, very demanding. Um, but I think, you know, everybody actually rose to the challenge. Like, yeah. you know, um, what I particularly enjoyed the most about it um, when we got things up and running and, you know, people became that little bit more familiar with being able to use uh, Zoom and the likes it was just touching base with the kids yeah. because it was awful. Like we were just catapulted, as you know, into this lockdown and it was so sudden and so quick and there was so much uncertainty that, you know, 
you you weren't really able to know like how they were doing you know yeah. were they okay were they not um and i know phil touched briefly earlier on about you know the, there was a terrible tragedy just before um mm. covid and that made things um a hell of a lot more challenging more difficult in the sense of again the distance between you and the kids and not knowing, you know, where they were at and not being able to support them uh, in in the capacity we would if we were there with them, you know. Yeah. So that was absolutely terrible. Yeah. Um, but once we got things up and running and we were able to just communicate and, you know, suddenly it became that little bit more um, normal again. And um, I suppose it gave us all a bit of peace of mind. Um, so yeah. hopefully it'll be behind us as well. Oh, I have yeah. a question there regarding um, my own daughter. She's 14. She's in third year, you know, um, and because of the lockdowns, I'm seeing a massive difference in um, the way she was previously. She was brilliant, you know, and she still is brilliant, you know, but um, I think the online learning thing really, really got to her, mm. you know, um, and being stuck in the room then as well. And the after effects of that at the moment are sh the, the habits that are after being created, you know, um, different habits, like um, maybe the phone, maybe the, the telly, you know, or maybe in her case, she l loves to read and it's just reading, reading, but it's nothing to do with school. And, and um, it's just, uh, do you see many problems with kids in, in terms of that? Like they just lost their kind of mojo and they're gone completely off track, mm -hmm. you know, and even like she was, she was brilliant w with school and she still is, as I said, but she has lost that kind of little bit of a drive. Have you seen that much with some of the students over the online learning and the difficulties that they may have faced and the anxiety and stuff it may have brought because of not being literate, computer literate and stuff and stuff like that? Yeah, absolutely. I think it, it created a great challenge for, for all kids. Mm -hmm. Um, I would say that there's a huge fallout here in terms of kids' mental health. Mm. And I reckon we probably won't even know for a yeah. number of years to come, you know, the the real severity of of, of this. Um, I think on a daily basis now at the moment, you can even see, you know, what, what kids are struggling um, as a result in terms of their own well-being um, and trying to kind of, uh, fit back into whatever this norm is at the moment mm -hmm. within school, even just simple things, the structure of the day. I mean, as we all know, like we, we might have struggled ourselves, you know, yeah. sleep pattern and so forth. I think we still have a bit of a distance to go um, in terms of being able to readjust and maybe reset. Um, but I, I think that we are we are going to be able to achieve that mm -hmm. um, and to remember that things things will go back to normal and things will be fine again but it's about reaching out and getting the support yeah. if if you are a, a student listening to this you know to know that there are people there and to go and to seek that help and there's no shame in that yeah. so I did see I did notice that her school were fantastic in mm -hmm. terms of you know they were very understanding around the this situation because because you know the enthusiasm was gone basically mm. so they were very understanding and we had a chat room mm. and everything went well you know so I well, think schools are doing too, yeah. like you know to me I think yeah. that um that learning is actually a social experience I would say mm -hmm. because you know this year I was going to sign up to do this a course actually on counselling supervision because I thought you know I'd like that would be kind of a next step I was a couple of grand to do it and I was looking at it and I thought I don't want to be sitting in front of a computer <laughs> engaging with these people who I'll never meet I, I wanted to go and learn with them in a room somewhere and have the chat with them during the coffee breaks and learn even more and get to know these people and know them as members of my class and get to kind of grow into the knowledge with them and I think here am I an adult I've been through a lot of learning yeah. experiences and I just thought nah I'll wait till it, we can meet yeah. and I'm sure if you look back on kind of doing your own courses it was the group it was the one or two you connected with it was maybe the more my wife, is doing a, my wife is doing a H-tip at the moment yeah and it's all online like and it's fucking hard for her because yeah. you missed the informal piece again Stuff be said in the lecture that you can take your notes and all that, 
but before the lecture you say how are you getting on with the essay and how yeah. are you getting on and if you don't have as many words then and they don't have as many words you don't feel so bad yeah and it takes the pressure off and then afterwards it's like um, what did you think of that one? You, you learn more, but when you're online, you miss all that. It's the yeah. same for the kids, you know. They like, I, I think, especially for teenagers, they're like when you're in secondary school, you kind of learn how to negotiate so many different social situations, you know, when mm. to stay quiet or you kind of learn it the hard <laughs> way, you know, when yeah. maybe to speak up. And suddenly they missed all of that. No wonder they're all glued to their phones. That's <laughs> safe. I know. You know? It's a comfort, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. We'll finish on a positive, right? So I'll go with you first, okay, and we'll give the principal the last word. <laughs> if you want to tell me um, the best part of working in Terence McSweeney Community College. Kids, hands down, 10 times over. <laughs> no hesitation. Yeah. Just every day um, getting an opportunity to actually learn from them. You know, I think best education I could ever have uh, received is just through my interactions with those kids. They yeah. teach me so much. So, Good, great so, answer. Yeah. Yeah, I would say definitely the kids. I love all the interaction I have with them. But I am very lucky as well. I have a lot of meetings with parents as well. And, you know, I interact with staff. And I think what makes, I suppose, maybe this is like somebody a bit of ego now, but it makes me feel good that the parents trust me a lot of the time. Not all the time. Why should they? But most of the time, you know, I, I feel such trust with them. That we're both on the same team trying to maybe work it out together for the interest of their child, you know. And I think I've had some really, I could say, beautiful conversations over the years, you know, yeah. and some very special friendships. Like there's a number of parents and their kids are long gone and they still contact me mm. and, you know, they invite me into very, I suppose, special moments in their family as well. I mean, I don't take that for granted. I think that's yeah. kind of amazing. Yeah, and it's interesting as well. It's like, it's not about the points or the, the grades. It's about the connections and the relationships we have with mm. with students, with teachers and with the parents. So um, it's been great to have you on the podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. Really you did. Yeah. Thanks very much for having us. Yeah, yeah. you're doing great work. And um, you're our first teachers, you're yeah. teachers and principal that we've had on. So it might be fair. You know, after all yeah. I said about the department, <laughs> It's, it's, it's great to have have um have a really positive side of it as well from school you know because sometimes i know myself and james we can ramble on too about the effects of, of our own teachers and back in the day you know and it's great to have the two of you on and talk about the good points of of, of not being in school as well and how the kids are i think it's fantastic so well done